Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I'm Michael Verschel, and I'm the director of the Consulting and Business Development Center here at the University of Washington's Foster School of Business. Um, we're running the seven-week series on the uh, for business owners, small business owners, um, with the idea that you know, with, with the impacts of COVID and the long-term economic recovery that we have ahead of us, um, getting some good advice and good insights, good counsel um, is um, it would be will be helpful. And we're really pleased we have an amazingly distinguished. A group of faculty who will be leading us. Um, so let, let's begin. Um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Professor Thomas Gilbert, Gilbert, he's an associate professor of finance and business economics at the University of Washington's Michael G. Foster School of Business. Uh, his research focuses on the on portfolio management for university endowments. So uh, uh, Professor Gilbert, I'm going to have a question for you about U, the UW's endowment, um, but, uh, but also looks at uh, public pension fund and pu pu public pension plans. Um, his research also includes cash management for public corporations, as well as the impact of macroeconomic announcements on financial markets. He's been teaching the main corporate finance class here at the Forrester School in the RMBA program for the last 10 years, and twice he's won the PACCAR Award for Teaching Excellence um, with that course. Uh, this quarter, he has created a new MBA class focused on financial data analytics and machine learning. Um, and since the onset of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic crisis in February. He's been a frequent, uh, has had frequent appearances on local media here in Seattle, uh, Como News, King Five, and Cairo News, um, and in the Seattle Times. And for those of you who saw today's, or, or an online edition of today's Seattle Times, um, he was quoted in there as well as Boeing is going through its uh, layoff uh, period here. But Professor Gilbert, we're really pleased to have you here um, and uh, welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for this kind introduction. It's a Pleasure being here with all of you. Thank you for joining us uh, tonight uh, as we talk about cash and debt in good and bad times and the trade-offs and opportunity costs that arise uh, as you go through a business cycle. Mm -hmm. As a small business, I will make uh, allusions to bigger businesses as well, but I will, of course, stay focused on the audience here tonight, which are uh, small businesses in the Seattle area or elsewhere, wherever you may be. Uh -huh. And we will, as I said, there will be, as, as Michael said, there will be no breakout rooms. Uh, we will um, have some time for Q&A. I will stop a few times uh, to answer questions and also have some polls as we go through this. Oh, so I'm curious as a little bit as to how, where everybody sits in their cash and debt levels or looking back or looking forward. And of course, we'll talk about the PPP uh, process uh, at some point. So do, do write your questions in the Q&A and then a couple of times uh, I will stop and Michael will field uh, questions. Um, so again, it's a pleasure, pleasure being here. And I also want to remind everybody that this is our role as educators. Uh, when you go to university or your children and so on, of course, we, we educate them. Uh, and we, but once you have gone through whatever university, the faculty remains present. Uh, the faculty remains a source of, of help, of advice, uh, our research. Um, and it, it really is, it gives me uh, even though times are very difficult for many of you, or for all of us in some respect, it, it gives me immense pleasure oh, in over the last few months for me to have been so involved in the media and trying to help people think through decisions that they have to make, oh, think through the logic, oh, bigger questions of what the Federal Reserve is doing or things like this. And uh, this, this has been, this is why we're here. This is why universities exist. Uh, and I would encourage everybody, wherever you are, to not hesitate to reach out uh, to your local university, uh, to the faculty, whether again, you're in the Seattle area or elsewhere. Uh, this is again, why, why we exist. Uh, so let me just start by, uh, of course, the state of affairs. So the state of affairs is, well, there's, I want to state that there's a little bit of self-selection. Uh, today is May 27th, uh, 2020. We're not, uh, it's not March. Uh, it's end of May. Uh, and you're here uh, as a small business owner. And so it means that probably you have struggling, but you have survived. Uh, uh, probably the small business owners who have closed shop are probably not here. So those of you are, you know, you have probably already pivoted, you've already looked forward. Some of you maybe have reopened in some fashion or so, some ways. Uh, and so I, I'm, I'm aware that there's some self-selection in the audience tonight. Uh, now, 
we we are let's be clear we are in a recession i've been saying this for for quite some time now uh, even though it's not official according to the national bureau of economic research uh, but we we are in a recession uh, but it is not a depression right gdp has decreased in the first quarter it's going to decrease uh, the number for the second quarter uh, which will be released in july will be far worse uh, but uh, this is again not surprising given the decisions that were made uh, the unemployment rate at the end of april stood at an unprecedented level uh, and it's going to look even worse in may uh, over the past nine weeks, you've all seen these numbers. So 38 million, 39 million jobless claims have been filed. And we have about 25 million individuals receiving uh, expanded, oh, since Congress has expanded unemployment benefits through the CARES Act. Oh. And you know these numbers are are very scary. Oh, of course, they're enormous. Oh, I think what is scariest here is the speed at which that this happened, obviously. Um, a recession typically has unemployment, like a sector uh, that blows up, huh? and then the, the contagion spreads to the economy, and unemployment sort of rises huh? over the course of several months. Uh, in 2008, 2009, it took many months to uh, get to an unemployment rate of 10%. And here, within a matter of two months, we reach an unemployment rate of 15%. Now, I just want to put this, just these numbers into perspective for just a second. Huh? The labor force entering the crisis was 160 million people. Huh? And if you think about the service sector and leisure and hospitality, huh? this is about 20% of the workforce, again, entering the crisis. And these are the sectors that we, for health reasons, decided to sort of lock down. Huh? So putting 20% of the workforce, huh? not completely, but in, in, in some just rough calculation, that's 32 million people roughly told you're not working huh? so the numbers that we're seeing while while scary are in line if you want with the health decisions that we made huh? we as, as, a, as a society through our elected officials huh? so and a lot of these jobs of course i i, I firmly believe huh, that the majority of these jobs will come back huh, as things reopen as businesses reopen oh the moment you can reopen you will rehire your workers and you will rehire more of them now it might take some time i think we have the, the v-shaped recovery is unlikely to happen huh, but um we're hopeful to have some swoosh recovery as you may have seen uh, mentioned in various places now, the public health crisis is obviously still present. Oh, they are encouraging signals that certainly in the US, oh, the curve has been flattened. Oh, we have not overwhelmed the healthcare system. Oh, even in New York City, where the healthcare system was overwhelmed at some point, things are, are looking far better. Oh, there are risks that remain. Again, I am not an epidemiologist and I will not go into that. Oh, and as a result, lockdowns are being, I would say, cautiously lifted. Different states are making different decisions, of course. This is heavily in the media. So there's, while well, well, the public health measures are in place, so things are, are moving forward, uh, again, cautiously. And it's, it's going to be a tug of war between, you know, health, uh, health restrictions and the demands of the economy to sort of open and to get things moving. Everybody wants to go back to work uh, and, and politicians want people to go back to work as well. But uh, some, you know, we are also careful that we don't want to uh, create a second wave or some, some flare ups and things like this. Mm. Small businesses are a key anchor of the economy and entering the crisis, just some numbers that I think are, are just very impressive, right? 30.2 million small businesses in the US. This is roughly 99.8% of the number of businesses are small businesses uh, with about 50, uh, 59 million employees. Uh, you contribute about 40% of the nation's, 44% of the nation's GDP, 20, the GDP is 20 trillion and you contribute about half. Uh, it's obviously critically important and you employ about 48% of the nation's workers. So, so this is, the, the, we all know this is a key contribution. Uh, but obviously we, you, you are struggling and we all are aware of this. So the, the economic crisis, uh, if you look back a little bit, so just a second, the economic crisis at first, it started as a supply chain shock, shock uh, from China as China struggled with the virus. So the supply chain uh, uh, sort of got messed up um, and this started sort of the crisis uh, and then this became a demand shock as the virus spread across all countries because now individuals became wary uh, travel collapsed uh, people stayed home and then public health policy choices forced sort of people to stay home uh, uh, there are externalities to uh, 
business as usual, uh, negative externalities. Uh, and so we made hard public policy choices. Uh, and this obviously forced your revenue way down uh, for some of you completely to zero. You were told to sh shut down. Uh, or, uh, and or at the same time, uh, your customers for various reasons had to cancel um, and became afraid or didn't want to go out or could not go out or and so on. And so your revenue was not say forced down by public policy choices, but by, directly by public policy choices, but just by, res by the response of your customers huh? and the market that you're in. Oh, think about concert venues or photographers, or things like this. Oh. And, uh, and, and potentially to, to, to close to zero. Huh? And obviously, so you have your top line that's sort of decreasing by 90, 90%, uh, and, but costs remain. Uh, you have to keep paying salaries if you're going to keep your workers, and you have to keep paying rent uh, if you have a building or an office. Uh, bills, you have to pay uh, your suppliers. Uh, and, and any debts that you may have, some debt payments, some interest payments, and so on. So then the crisis became a debt crisis, both at a household level and at a business level. It's how can we, over a period of time, which we know is limited, oh, we expect is limited, your revenue is way down, huh? can you meet these obligations, oh, the, the, these debt-like payments, be it bills, rents, and so on? Hmm. Now, policymakers know that you are the key to recovery. I think, I think the, the policymakers know that small businesses are key, huh? that they're a big part of the economy, and so on. And so the intent, uh, right, the, the public policy intent was, okay, well, let's freeze the economy on March 1. Since we're telling you we're freezing you, uh, we are you know, telling you to stop, uh, we will, as, of course, as seems fair, uh, to take over your payroll and your fixed costs. So we'll take over your salaries, your, your payroll, uh, and your fixed costs, your rent, your bills, uh, your, your key essential bills, and so on for the time of the lockdown of the pandemic and so on. And then we will unfreeze um, when it is safe. Uh, now, the implementation of this uh, has been difficult. Uh, some of you will probably roll your eyes and say it's been a catastrophe, uh, and I wouldn't disagree. Uh, it was done in a rush. We'll talk more about the Paycheck Protection Program a little later tonight. Uh, but uh, th this was not ideal. I know many of you have uh, applied, uh, uh, did not get anything, or, or got very little, or not enough. Uh, and there's stories in the media about large businesses getting uh, PPP funds. Uh, and you're left wondering, well, why are they getting it? And I'm not getting enough. Why well, I only got $1,000 when I really need 50000 or 100000 or 500000 um, And we, I totally agree. Uh, I had, I think I was expecting the SPA to be overwhelmed. Uh, and when rules are trying to be put in place over the course of a weekend, uh, it's not surprising after the fact that things, uh, the, the rules were not set in place uh, rightly. But I'll talk some more about this. So I am fully aware of your difficulty and your, that the, while the intent was right uh, from an economic point of view, uh, the implementation of this uh, freezing, if you want, uh, to let you survive the freeze uh, and, then, and then restart has been uh, far from optimal. But we'll come back to this. So just to be clear, right, there's a discussion, I think two important words that economists use is sort of liquidity versus solvency. I think it's helpful to think about the, the, the epidemic-driven crisis uh, that we're in right now, the virus-driven crisis, uh, in a, because we're in a consumer-slash-service economy, is similar to a weather-driven crisis in an agriculture economy. Uh, if you think about, well, there's a weather crisis uh, for one year, right, some terrible storms or tornadoes or things like this, uh, your soil is fundamentally healthy. Uh, you're fundamentally a solvent business. It's not like agriculture will disappear. Uh, it will stay. But this year's crop is lost. And so the farmer uh, has a liquidity crisis. For one year, the farmer has to survive, uh, given that the crop is gone, uh, that the revenue is gone. But the land itself is healthy. I, you are solvent. It is a solvent business idea. Uh, but you need to make it through. Uh, and again, the intent of the policy of various public policy uh, policies that were put in place uh, through the federal government, state governments, the Federal Reserve, and so on, um, 
was to bridge this liquidity to get solvent businesses through the little crisis uh, to the end uh, and, and make sure these solvent businesses don't close their doors permanently. Uh, businesses that were insolvent coming into the crisis, if they fail, uh, that's, you know, that's part of the natural process. Um, so I would say the majority of small businesses entered as solvent businesses. You are a viable long-term entity. You have a good idea. You have a good restaurant. You have a good corner for your restaurant. You have a good niche. Uh, you have a, you know, a gym that is popular. You have a photography business that, 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 that was uh, thriving. You have anyway, there's all sorts of small businesses uh, that, that were, it, you have a good idea. You have a good set of customers. You were appreciated uh, and things were going really well uh, on February 1st uh, and, and then things collapsed. Uh. So now you're facing a short-term liquidity crisis. If you don't come back and the questions are obviously really hard, right? Can you, so now we're in, we're in February, right? We're again, end of May. Uh. So can you make it another one month, right? With no limited revenue in the state of Washington, in most states, we are entering these phases of reopening huh? and you know i don't know each business may be in a slightly different area of these four phases again in the state of washington huh? and so you have to ask yourself right can you make it another month huh? with no or limited revenue right can you make it another three months with 50 percent revenue because we're in a recession right customers are going to take a while to come back huh? people are going to be cautious the economy is going to take some while to to bounce back so we can expect still quite reduced revenue for another quarter or so, or so certainly maybe through the end of the summer. Tourism this summer will be basically way, way down. So any industry that touches tourism from hospitality, leisure, parks, and so on, this is just going to be tough. And can you make another six months with 75% less revenue, 75% of your normal revenue, if you want? And, and these are just hard, um, hard questions. Do you have this liquidity? Can you, do you have access to liquidity oh, in that sense? And this is, these are tough, but I think you need, you need to ask yourself this. There's a famous, now famous, uh, analysis by JP Morgan uh, dated from 2016, where they surveyed uh, a very large number of small businesses in the US and asked about their cash buffer days and try to measure you know, how many days of cash do you have to sustain uh, the, number, the, the, the number of days of cash outflows that you could pay uh, out of its cash balance were its inflows to stop, which is literally what is happening now. Your inflows have stopped. Uh, can you, can, for how many days can you uh, sustain your outflows, uh, all outflows? And you, you see on this chart here, right, that the median business entered the crisis, roughly if we think 2016, you know, still applied to 2019, roughly, uh, with about uh, 27 days uh, worth of, of cash. So about a month. 25% uh, of businesses, right hand side of the tail, uh, two months of cash or more, and 25% of businesses less than two weeks of cash. Uh, restaurants are on the far left restaurants have very thin margins so it's difficult to save uh, out of very thin margins uh, and had the lowest amount of, uh, of 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 cash on hand and then you know healthcare services at 30 uh, high tech 32 and so on and these are these are all small businesses right just so we're very clear this is not uh, large businesses these are all small businesses so these numbers are are scary when we're talking about lockdowns uh, that last several months, uh, when only a quarter of businesses uh, entered the crisis with more than two months worth of cash, were your inflows to stop completely. Now, many small businesses have tried to, you know, change your operations as quickly as possible. If I think about restaurants, right, takeout and deliveries, uh, uh, telehealth, uh, uh, pickups. Uh, there, there's been a lot of innovation to try to sort of work, but there are businesses that have just been shut, huh? even though you still have to pay bills. Hmm. So I want to launch one first poll, because I'm just curious, huh? is uh, did you, looking back, huh, given, of course, today's situation and expectation, would you say that you entered the crisis with too much cash, about the right amount of cash, not enough cash, or no cash? Okay, and I've just launched a poll and you should be able to uh, vote. All right, so let me end the polling and uh, share the results with you. Uh -huh.
And there's a few of you who said, you know, you entered the crisis with too much cash. That's great. Uh, a few of you that entered the crisis with no cash. That's obviously uh, quite tough. And then uh, again, there's some self-selection, right? We have to be realized uh, tonight. So that's the, those of you on the phone are probably small business owners that are continuing uh, that have not given up. Uh, and so probably entered with the right amount of cash. Uh, it's almost uh, half of you. That's, that's pretty nice. Uh, and then, of course, a, a big chunk also has not enough cash. Uh, so, you know, how much cash is enough uh, is always a relatively difficult uh, question to, to ask. Um, but it seems like, you know, some of you think, you know, this, this was enough. Uh, now, what's the trade-off? Uh, when we think about cash management, and I want to keep talking about good times and bad times. Uh, so in good times, right, having too much cash uh, seems like a drag, right? Why am I holding all this cash on the balance sheet uh, when it's really not doing anything? I would like to invest. Uh, it's earning no return or close to no return. So your cash is maybe invested in CD accounts or money market funds earning 1% or something like this. Uh, and it's there sitting for some low probability, waiting for some low probability negative outcome. Um, not just one, just side point, of course, because uh, you I'm sure you've seen this in the media, right? Some large public firms, of course, in hindsight, look like geniuses for having excess cash in quotes, right? The most famous example is Apple with its $270 billion of cash. Uh, on its balance sheet at the end of December, equivalent to 60% of its book assets, the value of its book assets. So, so in hindsight, of course, this looks like absolute genius. Uh, now, ex ante, uh, this doesn't seem very clever, uh, and I'll discuss a little bit what they're doing with this cash uh, a little later. Now, that's not helpful, it doesn't apply to you at all, it's just an interesting extreme example in the public sphere. Uh, just to have a point of comparison, if we look at all the public firms, uh, the median public firm, i.e. publicly traded firm, um, including all the small stocks, so uh, publicly traded small stocks, hold cash, if you sum up cash, cash equivalents and short-term marketable securities, if they have any, it's roughly 5% of sales. So, and if you look at the average, it's about 15% of sales. The average is higher than the median because there's a large right tails, right? Firms like Apple hold a lot of cash and so they push the mean to the right oh, in terms of when we take an average. So this is just a, a point of comparison that may help you a little bit benchmark oh, how you think. Now, of course, oh, uh, public firms have access to more capital oh, and, uh, and, and this makes things not necessarily comparable, and I fully agree with this, but I think it's helpful to have some notion a little bit as to what publicly traded firms do. Now, in case it was not clear, uh, saving for a rainy day was, is, and always be key. Uh, now, this seems so obvious, right? This seems like a tautology. Why is the professor wasting my time saying saving for a rainy day is a good thing? Um, now, saving is hard. Uh, saving is hard when margins are small. I mentioned restaurants, so we all know that, that margins are very, very thin and there's other businesses like this. And or when, of course, positive net present value projects arise. Oh, why would I save when I have you know, potentially good employees to hire? Oh, and I wanna mention, I spent a few, couple of minutes talking about behavioral norms oh, that impede saving. Saving is difficult and I thought oh, it might be helpful to just sit, step back for just a second and think about uh, what have we learned in the research front about individual behavior, household behavior relative to retirement savings? Um, now, this is not what we're talking about here. This is small businesses. Uh, but uh, since many of you in, in your businesses have you know, less than 20 employees, uh, I think what we've learned on the research front from the behavior of households, I think, I think we can learn a lot from this as to how a small business with say five employees uh, would behave uh, because I think it's there's some comparison with this, there's some parallels between a household and, and, a, and a business with say a few less than 10 employees. Mm. So what have we learned from research briefly with respect to retirement savings behavior? So people are more likely to start and keep saving small amounts more frequently rather than large amounts less frequently. It's overwhelming for financial advisors to tell their clients, oh, hey, you should save, you know, $5,000 a year or $10,000 a year or max your IRA at, at, at or your 401k, or your IRA at 6,000 and your 401k at 15,000. Oh, that's overwhelming for people. But if you tell them, hey, you have to save 10 bucks a day oh, or 10 bucks a week. Oh, and if you multiply that by the number of weeks, you get to the same 
big number, uh, this seems much more manageable. Um, and people are more likely, evidence has shown, research has shown uh, that, th that this works better. People are more likely to save and keep saving if they're auto-enrolled, i.e. you have to opt out rather than opt in. If it's opting into a savings behavior, the hurdle, the mental hurdle is much higher and people don't do it. But if they're already enrolled automatically and you have to opt out if you don't want to save, people are less likely oh, to, uh, to opt out. Oh, and so they'll save. And we've also learned, a uh, third big finding, uh, that when people, this is mental accounting, uh, when people receive a positive windfall, some unexpected, uh, like a bonus, an expand cash inflow, they're more likely to increase their spending and spend on stuff that they would not otherwise um, buy um, compared to regular. So they, it's like a, it's a mistake, basically, right? You're thinking it, it's mental accounting. People put a bonus in a different mental accounting bucket in their head compared to their regular income. So they're like, oh, well, I'll spend differently. I'll spend more from it, a higher percentage of it. So, and so the point here is that research has shown that mental accounting and inertia are very powerful forces to overcome. So what I would, what I would learn from this is, can we put systems in place in a small business, so working with your banker or with some apps or, or, or things like this, so to remove barriers, to nudge you, to minimize effort to save more? Um, again, half of you said you had about the right amount of cash, but half of you said you did not have enough cash. So what can we in good times... So, do, do this here. And I think that there's the behavioral finance research has shown us that mental accounting is very powerful and we need to put systems in place to overcome some of this, these behavioral biases. So in bad times, so, so in bad times, it's optimal to spend, oh, right? You saved, you created a buffer account in order to spend it in bad times. And while it's painful to see the buffer decrease, right? To see the savings account oh, that you've built oh, as a small business go down. Oh, it is the right thing to do. If you're solvent, oh, you want to get through it and spending it is right. That's why you saved it in the first place. Oh. Every dollar counts. Oh, so you need to watch your spreadsheet like a hawk. Oh, it is, you should spend, you know, more hours than ever before in Excel, oh, looking at every dollar and every dollar matters. So, oh. Can you reduce costs? Huh? Can you renegotiate with your point of sales provider, with your credit card? Can we switch credit card? If it's $59 versus $79, that's $20 saved. Huh? Now, for some of you with businesses that are you know, thinking about revenues in like hundreds of thousands of dollars, you're thinking of oh, 20 bucks. Come on, Thomas. Huh? But it adds up. Huh? Go through expenses line by line, rank by decreasing necessity, and make the tough decisions. You're going to have to cut. Huh? Uh, and you just go line by line uh, and you change point of sales provider, as I said. Uh, you have this, it's business. Uh, you make the decisions needed. And some of these are very hard. Uh, you might have to let go of relationships uh, that you've built over the course of a long time. Uh, but this is, it's that for survival. Um, delay differ all possible bills or pay partial bills. Uh, I talk to your, um, I'll talk some more about your suppliers and customers in a minute. Um, the point here is saving a dollar today decreases the likelihood of bankruptcy tomorrow oh, because you'll have that extra dollar tomorrow. Oh, and so it's, you know, every little bit matters. Oh, do not take financial risk with the cash, whatever cash you're saving, oh, right? Don't go gamble it oh, in the financial markets. That's very small aside, 10 seconds. So this is what Apple and these big companies do with it. This is why I mentioned cash early on in quotes. So oh, Apple actually takes its cash uh, and invests it in mortgage-backed securities, corporate bonds, and things like this. So obviously, this doesn't apply here, but I thought you might be interested in knowing what they're doing with their $200 billion. Mm. The point is, if you're going to take risk with this cash, you should take operational risks, right? Spend it on key employees. Keep them uh, if you can, if you want to, if it's really important. And keep that's a risk worth taking because the moment you can reopen, this employee is there and you're not going to have to search for this person again. Uh, now, decrease short-term accounts receivables, okay? So you have... You need to collect, basically, all right? You want to shorten your accounts receivable. You need to decrease your accounts receivable. Oh, you need to collect from your customers. Oh. And this can be hard because obviously customers are struggling too. So there's sort of a, a, a trade-off here. There's a, there's a pull and a tug and so on. Oh. 
And you're also thinking, well, but there's also the side that I want to keep these customers. So maybe I want to keep extending some credit lines to customers uh, because I want them to come back uh, at full speed when things come back to full speed. So, but be, you know, push if there are customers, right? When, when, when you have a book of business, some customers really matter and some customers matter less in the short term. And maybe the ones that are a bit less important and you need to push on like collecting. Oh. You need to increase, if you can, your accounts payable, okay? So basically push it to 60 days, push it to 75 days, push it to 90 days, so whatever you can. Oh, obviously this is hard because on the other side, there's a supplier oh, who is struggling. And the supplier looks at its accounts receivable, which is your accounts payable and says, well, oh, buddy, that's all very nice, oh, but I actually need to collect oh, to stay in business. So there's of course a tension here and it's not easy. Oh. And if you're a small business and you're talking to a large supplier, your, 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 um, your bargaining power is obviously reduced. Oh, but you know, try, oh, negotiate, push, oh, reduce inventory, sell your inventory. Oh, now, related to the earlier point, if your accounts payable extend a long time, this may affect future shipments, right? Your supplier may say, well, you haven't paid me in 90 days. Oh, so yeah, I understand you want more oh, of whatever supply that is, but I can't, you know, you need to pay me something. Mm. You're also thinking, all right, well, let's increase prices. Uh, but, the, the, you know, the issue here is that uh, there's a potential negative demand response, all right? Increasing prices and passing on some of the cost of the customer seems fine, but the customer is also struggling. Uh, and the customer might say, well, look, I just lost my job. My spouse lost my job, her job or his job. Uh, and we're struggling here, right? There's a lot of discussions of PPE surcharges by dentists, for instance. Uh, and while we don't understand why this is happening, uh, but th there's a potential negative impact here. And maybe what's needed, going back to a point that I said earlier, the margins may need to decrease first to win or keep the customers. Uh, and, then, uh, and then at some point, uh, prices can increase. But this is, so slow prices, but you need to be, you need to be aggressive as much as you can. Um, all right, here I'll take a, a break and Michael, oh, I'll take some questions here. Great, um, so, great Thomas, thanks. Um, so, uh, so just some uh, definitional question first. Uh, when you talk about cash, right, keeping cash, does that include um, the room that you have left on your line of credit? Yeah, I mean, I would almost say, I mean, I think you should. Yes. Uh, I mean, and I think you should even draw, I would even draw on that line of credit uh, uh, as much as you can right now. Uh, if you look at our, you know, big local company, uh, Boeing, it's again, the news today, uh, like they just, this is one they did immediately. Like you draw your whole line of credit, you put as much cash as you can in your firm. Uh, and so I would say like, take it. Uh, you need every dollar possible uh, in order to survive one more day, keep key employees, uh, and then and be ready to reopen. Because the moment all these things get uh, sort of losing key employees and so on, th this happens, then the whole reopening, it doesn't, it's not a switch anymore. Um, and so, uh, yes, but I would even say one, one should draw on this line of credit as much as possible. Well, now's the time. This is why you have a line of credit. So it's for a time like now. And then Shelby's got a question. Um, uh, what about the amount of, uh, so, so when you um, delay payments, there's often fees associated with that, right? How do you make the judgment call of delaying payments but incurring more fees when you're trying to conserve cash? It's, it's, it's a, it's a trade-off, but I would say like, if, if you are, if you're thinking, if, if the fees uh, can be, you know, again, yes, they'll be piled on uh, and, but they can be delayed. This may be a cost worse incurring uh, in the future uh, because in the future you will reopen like the question is again like what is it, it's it's a dollar today versus a dollar tomorrow and i think it's how likely it's it, it's an expectation of how likely you think you are to be able to go back to some reasonable level of revenue tomorrow be it 50 percent or 60 percent or 70 percent uh, and this is a judgment call. Every business is a little different, or is, is, is different. Or every small business is different. But I would say these are costs worth, if you are solvent, or, then this is a cost worth incurring. Or, and potentially I would, but 
I'll go back to this in the debt discussion, like I would negotiate this as much as possible. Oh, like this, this is again something where I think there's power to negotiation. Your, your supplier, for instance, uh, would rather get paid something at some point rather than zero forever. Oh, and so it's like, look, I am struggling. I understand we're going to pile on some fees, oh, but you know, can we work something there? Oh. Thomas, it's great to hear you talk about negotiations. Uh, just as a, a little uh, advertisement for next week, uh, we have a Liz Professor Elizabeth Umpress who will be talking about negotiating and negotiating skills next week, so we can dive into how to do that. Uh, a question about, uh, we, you have a fan here, somebody who, uh, who heard you talk in the State of the Economy uh, lecture. Um, and uh, when we, uh, during that point, you talked about not buying during, uh, buying versus not buying, renting, not renting during that time. Um, could you talk about the pros and cons of cash and debt um, as, you know, especially, you know, how much cash versus how much debt to take on those, you know, how do you balance that out um, in this period? So I think the cash, the, 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 the cash balance right now needs to be, it should be going down, right? In the sense that it should be, this is the point that I made, like it should be spent in order to survive, right? So, and then you need to draw and borrow. So the line of credit was a very good question. And I'll talk about that in a minute. So to, to keep some inflow coming, some capital coming. And again, it comes back to your expectation of solvency. If you have a solvent business at the moment, phase two starts, let's say in the state of Washington, you can expect, I don't know, X percent of your revenue to come back. And if you think, okay, this, this, this means for me solvency, then spending the cash to get to say July, oh, July one, oh, and having this influx of cash through borrowing, drawing on your line of credit, oh, that is the right, it's the right thing to do. Oh, if you, the rate of return and the rule that I'll say in a second, right, if the expected rate of return oh, on your fundamental opportunity cost of capital, i.e. The, the solvency of your business, the fundamental return of your business is higher than the interest rate that you're gonna pay on the debt, so then the debt, the dollar of debt is worth taking. Oh, because if you're gonna borrow at eight, so, but your business fundamentally returns, I don't know, 12 oh, percent, so, then this is, this is right. This is the optimal thing uh, to do. Now, if you're thinking that for six months, my rate of return is 5%, so, and I have to pay a debt interest rate of 8%, now that is a different situation where I think your solvency is much more in question. But that is the fundamental trade-off that people have to think about, is the, the interest rate that you're paying on the amount borrowed versus the fundamental rate of return on your, on your, on your, on your business. So, so we have a number of questions. F folks are phrasing it in slightly different ways around um, around how to make this, those decisions about what to invest in in your business, right? So, so uh, there's a question around, should you invest in advertising? Question around, should you pay your employees more to get them to come back to work? A uh, uh, question around, um, how much of the PPP do I use to, to pay employees to keep them on? Um, again, you know, any sort of, you know, how would you guide folks around, how, if they have cash, how, do you, how much of it to use? how to use it, when to use it. Yeah, so I think, uh, I think keeping key employees, I think is very important. I think it's very clear that, well, we've learned that shutting down an economy, like think about a light switch, that seems, we seem to have become very good at it. Uh, but uh, an economy is not something you can just flip the switch back on uh, and goes, you know, right back business as usual. Um, that's just very hard. In particular, the moment the human capital oh, of the firm is gone. Oh, so if your restaurant and your key chef oh, is gone, oh, or your, your, your key photographer, or your, your building manager, or your, you know, your, your main trainer who has just motivated all your clientele and all the other trainers in your gym or something like this. Oh, like the moment these people, you can't get them back oh, because they had to move on huh, for their own household finance uh, problems, huh? moved on to another job, to another state, to, to, and uh, expanded unemployment insurance. There's incentives here that are a little screwed up right now where people are, in some instances, making more huh, being unemployed huh, than they are being employed. But that, to me, that seems the key uh, thing here is the key employees huh, that are the core of... The, the solvency of your business 
This is very important because if you lose those, then flipping the switch back on is never going to happen. Oh, this is going to be a very slow reopening of your own business because you're going to have to refine this human capital, retrain it. Oh, and that takes a long, long time if that is lost. Oh, so that to me remains the number one thing. Oh. And if people have to downscale, right, move to a smaller office or whatever, like th these are things that I think are more easily cuttable, depending, again, if you're a restaurant, you have the restaurant, like that, that's hard to move. Oh, but if it's more of a service, maybe you move to a smaller place or you work from home or the basement or something like this. And that can always be oh, readjusted. But the, the human capital is to me what is, and what is key in finance research, like this is what is very important. So then a uh, question about you know, if you have some cash, um, should you invest it outside the firm? Should you keep it in the firm? Uh, and, you know, how much liquidity versus tying it up in outside, um, in outside investments, even if you can get a high return on the outside investment? Yeah. So, I mean, I, so this is what Apple, so going back to my example, right? This is sort of what Apple does. Oh, so, right. Apple has this 200 billion in cash. Oh, they have no good ideas within the firm. And so what do they do? They park it in the financial markets. Oh, and by revealed preferences, when you observe them doing this, this is telling you, well, oh, they're, they believe they can earn a higher return in the financial markets oh, than they can by taking that dollar and spending it on whatever, another computer scientist. Oh, but uh, as a small business like this, to me, it just doesn't make any sense whatsoever, uh, right? Like this is, it's about the business itself, uh, the cash to be spent on the business uh, and potentially spend on, as I said, keeping key employees, keeping the key machines, the IP, the patents, uh, the location. If this is the key, key thing uh, that makes your business long-term viable, uh, like it is about, it is about keeping it uh, in-house uh, and, and spending it on the business. So uh, I'll have one last question here and then we'll let you go on with the rest here. But um, f flipping on the other side, right? We talked about conserving cash now, uh, but we, we have a question around uh, how, how much do you push your, uh, your customers to get paid? Um, and, how, and how do you make those decisions about who to push and how much to push? Yeah, so decreasing your accounts receivable and vice versa, right? Decreasing your, increasing your accounts payable, but de in, uh, sorry, decreasing your accounts receivable, i.e. pushing your customers to pay, uh, i.e. collecting. Um, I, think, I, think it's important, I think it's important to push. And I think the way I would look at it is, again, as you need to sort of, say, you need to sort of rank order your book of business, right, from the most important, which is not necessarily size, uh, but most important customer to the sort of least important customer, the customer that's most replaceable. There's just one in, you know, one of many. But if you have, you know, very important customers uh, that are key, um, uh, the most important ones, the most loyal ones, or the most, you know, networky ones or things like this, those are ones where you don't want to, you know, annoy them because uh, they need to stay. Uh, but the ones that are sort of least important, where there'll be another one once it's reopened, so then those are the ones where you need to collect as fast as possible. Like there's some order of priority here huh, of, of who are the key uh, customers. So, and you sort of need to, at some level, force out oh, the least important ones oh, by collecting oh, from them and telling them, look, this, this is the bills due and bills due now. Oh. But the, the one that's going to be um, most critical to the long-term solvency, these are ones where uh, if they cannot uh, uh, pay and you cannot collect from them immediately, these are ones with whom you would, I would advise negotiating uh, and being okay with keeping, keeping an account, as an account receivable uh, because you need that person to still be your customer 30 days from now or 60 days from now. Great, thanks. So let me continue. Uh, and the two discussions, and we'll come back, we'll have another session of Q&A uh, uh, afterwards. So on the, on the debt side, and these things are obviously tied, and I'll make that clear. So debt, uh, debt has a, an evil connotation, uh, going back to Shakespeare and, and the likes. Uh, but debt, debt is not evil. Uh, and I made the point uh, just in one of the questions, right, so that borrowing at a rate that is below your opportunity cost of capital is optimal. The example in the higher education sector is that taking on a student loan at 4.53%, which is the current rate on, on federal student loans, to fund a computer science degree is optimal optimal because the expected return, huh, the expected return, not, not the guaranteed return, but the expected return on the CS degree is very, very high. It's far higher than 4.5%. So, 
And so uh, it, it's a no brainer that you should, if needed, if you can pay for your higher education using cash, sure, go for it, uh, but uh, uh, to, to take on a student loan there. Um, now leverage obviously increases the expected return of a project. This is just a small example, right? If you have a, 50, a project with a 15% inherent rate of return, but you fund it four to one with a loan, so you lever up four to one oh, with a loan charging 7%, oh, the project of 15% becomes a 47%. Oh, that's what leverage does. Oh, all of you who own a house oh, understand, uh, understand this very well. But the flip side of this, of course, is that the volatility, and in my example, that 15% project has an inherent volatility, an inherent risk of 25%, uh, that volatility also scales up because of the leverage uh, and becomes 125%. So this is where debt on the downside, the volatility is an up and down measure. And it's an upside potential, which is the 47% expected return. And the downside, of course, is when bad times hit, you still owe the debt. And, and so this is what this, this enormous volatility captures. So that's, that's the risk. Now, debt has a tax incentive. This is all clear. And debt uh, leverage uh, provides discipline, uh, which uh, as researchers, we've pushed this angle for a long time. Uh, this is obviously, we have lots of research in the, on public corporations, but I think that the, the logic applies to households uh, and, uh, and small businesses as well, small and medium sized businesses, uh, that leverage provides discipline. Uh, you have to pay your debt interest payments. Uh, and so, because if you miss those, they're the liability at the very top of the pile. Uh, and they will come after you oh, if you don't make these payments. Oh, so it provides discipline. It reduces the incentive to misbehave, oh, misbehave uh, in quotes. Oh. So when in moderation, this is, this is fine. Oh, the problems arise, of course, when people borrow too much oh, and expect good times to continue. Going back to behavioral finance research, oh, people have shown, uh, we have, we as researchers have shown that recency bias is heavily present in humans. Uh, so we believe that whatever happens in the recent past uh, will continue. And we are completely hopeless uh, at foreseeing and forecasting for tail event and hence plan for tail events. Uh, we think that, oh, it's been good. It's going to continue being good. Uh, so let's keep on borrowing. Let's pile on the credit card debt. That's a household example. Uh, and this, of, of course, uh, so going back to accounts payable, right? Accounts payable is a debt-like instrument, I just want to mention. So increasing your accounts payable, if you can, is optimal. It is borrowing from your suppliers, right? If you can extend from 45 days to 60 days, you're increasing your leverage. You are borrowing from your supplier. And if you can, huh, I would strongly suggest for you to do so. Huh? Even if it's 15 more days, right? This is just 15 days gained. Huh? And we're at a point now at the end of May where 15 days is maybe all you need huh? or 30 more days is all you need. Huh? So th th this is just push this as much as you can. So I wanna do a, a second poll here, a two part poll. Looking back, uh, would you say that you entered the crisis with too much debt, the right amount of debt, little debt or no debt? Uh, and the second part is, is now a good time for your business to take on additional debt? Yes, no, not sure. So looking back, uh, so would you say you entered? So people entered, so the majority said uh, too little debt. Uh, many of you actually a quarter uh, entered the crisis with no debt whatsoever. Uh, a quarter of you would say you entered the right amount of debt and 15% with too much debt. So again, so some sample selection, given that you, you have survived uh, this far. Uh, it's interesting, and I'm encouraged to, to see you take, the, you know, so the majority of you, 34%, said you entered with too little debt. Oh, you could have taken on more debt. So now is a good time. So it's interesting, the parallel between question one and question two is now a good time uh, for your business to take on additional debt. 35% uh, said yes, 40% uh, uh, said no, uh, and 24% are unsure. So uh, there's, there's uh, so Many of you think you're too little debt, uh, but maybe now is not a good time uh, uh, to, to, to take on more debt. And that's a tricky, uh, uh, tricky, so let, tricky trade off. And let's talk about this in a second. Um, so if you have debt, uh, so if you think that you need to, you know, to repay the debt, you have too much debt, you need to pri prioritize and so on. And this is sort of preserving cash, uh, for instance. Uh, so maybe you have to make some tough choices. So obviously, failing to repay debt is the one thing that can trigger bankruptcy. Uh, both, uh, so this is true for public corporations, but this is true for everyone, right? If you fail to pay your mortgage, uh, you will go into receivership. Uh, and for small businesses, this is all, this is all the same. Um, so... 
so in a crisis, I would say everything is negotiable. So negotiate. Oh, I think I have been advising this uh, again in the media for households and so on to coach the mortgage broker. Oh, and I think businesses are doing this. Uh, we've seen big public corporations even, right? Tesla has called its landlords and Starbucks has called its landlords and said, look, <laughs> the rent needs to go down. Oh, and so just keep pushing, keep pushing. So of course the landlords are you know, struggling on their end, but everybody's starting to realize, has realized by now, right, that we're better off, you know, getting 75% uh, of, so one side of getting 75% of the revenue, uh, the, the landlord, uh, you're obviously happier to pay 75% rather than 100%, uh, and 75% is better than zero. So we need to push. So of course, however, there are some debt covenants, some rules within the debt contracts that each business has that you may need to follow, and some of them are obviously non-negotiable. Uh, but uh, I would say like, you need to push as much as possible. Now, if you need to prioritize, uh, if you need to say, okay, well, I have limited cash, I can't pay all the bills, so uh, how do I do this? Uh, so I think what you need to do is going back to the, this idea of the customer ranking, uh, you need to rank in decreasing order of necessity. Uh, like what is, repay the instruments first that are absolutely essential for survival, right? Uh, what is, what is which creditor of mine huh, is key to my survival huh, right which creditor can i not sort of to use bad word like piss off basically huh? and then you go down the list huh? and the least important if you have to push then that you delay right you defer and i was on tv saying that with their stimulus checks huh, if people are unemployed people should not pay their credit card huh? uh, this is again couple of months ago. Huh? And the same logic, I think, applies here. Huh? The credit card payment can be delayed, huh? but the payment to potentially a key supplier or key bank huh? or key creditor, huh? maybe you need to pay. Huh? Maybe you need, don't pay the whole amount. This is where you negotiate and you say, okay, well, can I pay 50% and then we push the rest back and so on and so forth. Huh? And if it's equal necessity, then how you repay debt, oh, the rule is quite simple. You repay the highest interest rate first. Oh, so if you're at an equal level of necessity, you just prioritize whatever is going to charge you the most interest oh, from period one to period two. This is the standard uh, rule that, that we teach. And I think what is very important here, oh, and I think what's got a lot of bad press in various areas, is to keep creditors informed. Oh, transparency, openness, advance notice go a long way. Oh, bankers are, you know, people, oh, and they want to hear from you. And suppliers are people, oh, and you can talk to them and keep them informed. This is what my cash flow situation looks like. Oh, this is what we can expect over the next few weeks. So. Oh, and people don't like to be surprised. Oh, and so being transparent, being honest, being open, oh, I think can go a long way in that negotiation oh, and it's in this sort of prioritizing of, of debt payments and reimbursements. Mm. And going back to the poll questions, I think that was interesting. It may be optimal to take on more debt right now. If you have valuable asset, assets, uh, buildings, machines, intellectual property, and so on, you will be able to borrow. Uh, a bank will be able to lend to you, will be willing to lend to you against this collateral. Uh, now, potentially the interest rate is not great right now, uh, but you know, if, if you need to borrow, that this could be quite good. Growing maybe seems crazy right now. Uh, but again, for those of you on the phone today at the end of May, you're thinking, well, yeah, prices are low. Uh, the labor market is loose. Uh, there's potentially key, you know, key people we could hire uh, and steal from, um, from uh, competitors that are struggling. Uh, and this is, not, uh, this is not a bad idea. And, and I think 35% of you say now is a good time to take on additional debt. Uh, and I would agree with this. Going back briefly to the PPP, the Paycheck Protection Program, right? So the idea, again, the intent was to take over your payroll. Now, the execution, fully agree, far from satisfactory. Many, 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 many thousands of small businesses got nothing. Applications, botch, process, and so on and so forth. So fully agree with this. So, and then many of many small businesses then bulk when there was the second round about the whole loan forgiveness. Is it going to become a grant under what conditions? Uh, is I need to spend 75% on it on payroll for it to be forgiven and the rules are changing. Is it different from my business for restaurants and the treasury department keeps changing its mind and so and so on and so forth. So, but I think the uncertainty here plays in your favor. And I would say, if you are solvent, if you think that the expected return huh, on your fundamental business uh, is high enough, uh, then it is completely right to take this debt, uh, to take whatever debt you can. Uh, that's why I said, like, draw on your line of credit. Uh, and the interest rate uh, will be low enough at potentially zero, and the rules that keep changing on this PPP. Uh, 
and, and, and other programs. PPP is not the only program out there, but certainly the one that has gotten the small attention uh, for, for small businesses. Um, so th th this is the right thing to do. So last poll uh, that I want to do on the PPP. Uh, so this, it's a three-part uh, poll here, and I'm curious, uh, is did you apply? Yes, no. Uh, if you applied, did you receive it? Uh, and if you receive it, uh, do you think it will help you uh, um, survive the recession? Right, let me end the polling and share the results with you. So did you apply? Uh, but uh, two thirds, one third, uh, 60, sorry, 60, 40, 65, 35. Uh, uh, so not everyone applied. Uh, if you applied, did you receive it? Uh, uh, the majority of you who applied did receive it. So uh, that's actually good. Again, some selection, self-selection in the audience. So uh, if you receive the PP loan grant, do you think it will help you? 51% uh, says yes. Now, of course, even if you receive an amount that is way too small, uh, it still helps. $10,000 is better than zero, even though you wanted $150,000, uh, let's say. Uh, and some, of course, is, is still not sure. So the results here are, 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 are encouraging, uh, actually, uh, which, is, which is nice to hear. Um, so let me go back. So let me just try to wrap up on uh, cash and debt together. So the management of your left-hand side cash uh, of your balance sheet and the right-hand side, the debt side of your balance sheet uh, are not independent, right? The goal right now, the current goal is basically to decrease your net working capital net of cash. So we want more cash. We'll create this. But we want to decrease all the other current assets. So you want to decrease your inventory. You want to decrease your accounts receivable. You want to collect. Uh, and ideally, you want to increase uh, your accounts payable uh, and increase uh, your, your debt potentially, as we just discussed, is, is the, the, the right thing to do. It is optimal to do uh, in order to bridge uh, this, this short-term liquidity crisis, uh, even though it is uh, scary to take on more debt uh, in this time. Uh, so in bad times, you need to bridge. So save cash, borrow, negotiate, as we just discussed. Uh, there's a great quote that I thought I, I'd, I'd leave, uh, bring here that I really like, which is the seeds... Uh, so I want to go back to good times. We're talking about bad, bad times, but then split back to bad times, good times a little bit. The seeds of bad corporate policies are sown in good times. So the point that I'm trying to make here is, of course, right now it's all about survival. But I, want, I would like you to start thinking about the, the future, the good times, and the mistakes that potentially you made in good times, 2019, 2018, and so on. Not mistakes in quotes. So, or, or policies that maybe you didn't quite put in place right, uh, quite right. Uh, and as to what changes you're gonna make when things get back to normal. Um, so in good times, uh, this is when you wanna set up sound policy that can work in bad times. How can we increase saving? How can we borrow only for valuable projects? How can we make sure we set up systems in place uh, to make sure that we have enough cash, uh, even though it's so hard to save. It seems so dumb to save another $1,000 uh, or, or $10,000 or $50,000 in cash. Uh, I want to open another uh, uh, location for our gym or whatever uh, it is that you're doing. Uh, but this is this, you need to do this in good times. You need to think about this in, in good times. Uh, because if you don't do it in good times, it's not in bad times that you're going to put policies in place. In bad times is when you take the fire hose uh, and you try to extinguish the fire. Uh, and so, but in good times is when you think about, huh, where do we need to place the fire hose, the fire hoses? So, so that in bad times, so when the fire starts, so we are optimally equipped and the fire hoses are, are available um, at appropriate distances. So, um, sorry, no pun intended. Um, I want to leave with one idea before we go to the final Q&A uh, is equity capital. Um, so think about any all sources of capital uh, and potentially equity is a source of capital, a private equity partner. Small businesses are, are not public, you guys are all private. So, but maybe taking a partner, yes, it dilutes your ownership claim. But as long as this equity claim, this you know 30% of your firm value or whatever is sold at fair value to your new partner, it's simply a transfer from future expected dollars that you would have received into a lump sum package uh, today, which if you invest at the same opportunity cost of capital, you'll end up in the same place. And this avoids increasing your leverage. Uh, so I think this is not completely crazy. And I would encourage some of you to, to think about this. If you have a solvent business, there are always investors with money uh, that they want to put at work. Um, 
and I've heard stories on the news of businesses struggling. The example that I care a lot about here in Seattle, just to make mention of one, is, is Molly Moon's ice cream. My kids love to go there. Oh. And uh, Molly is, is, is struggling, uh, even though I think it's a viable business. It's a completely viable business. Uh, so my, my advice to her was, and I, I, I said this uh, in the news, is like take, take an equity partner. Uh, um, and I, I think someone will be happy to invest whatever, uh, $500,000 in your business and take some equity claim uh, to be negotiated. But this is not something that should be um, sort of, I, I think it's worth keeping in mind. So with that, I realize it's already 6.36, but I'll take questions. All right, so we'll, I'll try to lump, lump three questions into one um, sure. to be respectful of everybody's time on, on this meeting. So, uh, and there's sort of more macroeconomic questions, Thomas. Um, question around PPP, do you think the policymakers are gonna make any changes um, you know, in terms of the structure and, and to move from a, a loan to a grant? Um, question then about uh, banks and holding mortgages and, you know, uh, if you delay payments, what's, what, what policies will banks likely pursue? Um, and then a question around um, uh, residential foreclosure and what do you anticipate happening in residential foreclosure? And are we going to go back to uh, a situation like we had in 08, 09, where people are doing a lot of short selling? Oh, this is spanning a, a wide array uh, of <laughs> things. Uh, thank you. Um, um, PPP changes. So I think this remains a fluid process. Uh, I think the PPP process uh, is going to, in the, the rules in particular that the SBA is putting in place through the Treasury Department, uh, are going to remain a process in flux. And I think there the uncertainty plays to your advantage. Uh, I think it's, it's not completely, uh, I think it's quite likely that the rules will be changed uh, still going forward. Uh, as more, and in particular there, what's important is as more information keeps coming out uh, about who has borrowed, uh, I have the, are these, as the economy starts reopening, are these businesses reimbursing uh, or who's being forgiven and who isn't? Because this is all f under the Freedom of Information Act, uh, information that is available to researchers and the media uh, to sort of publicize. Uh, and this will kept uh, being pushed. Uh, and so I think the Treasury Department will be in uh, continued high levels of pressure from constituents in Congress uh, to make, to, to, to move more and more towards loans being forgiven for small, for in particular small businesses uh, of, of money obtained through the PPP program. So there, I, I remain quite confident that so the, the, the Treasury Department will, will continue to make things look more and more like grants. Um, the second one, if missed payments, uh, what are banks likely to do? So there, you know, I, I, again, I think the advice here is to negotiate uh, and to try to come to terms with the bank uh, before. Like, don't surprise your bank. Uh, talk to your banker. Talk to your local banker. Uh, you have a relationship with your local banker, be it Wells Fargo or a small local bank, Umco Bank or whatever it is, uh, and to explain the situation to them and say, okay, well, I can pay only 25%. Uh, are we going to just defer and lump sum everything the moment I become solvent Again, for three months, I have to pay the whole bucket of what I'm owed plus fees and interest and so on. That seems unfeasible. And, and, and keep negotiating, keep pushing. Uh, there are more, like they don't want bankruptcies either. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and complete payments going to zero. Uh, but, you know, it's, banks have a lot of support through the Federal Reserve. Uh, so they are willing to, t they are willing to take losses uh, because these losses are being backstopped by the Federal Reserve and the Treasury Department. Uh, so they'll, they'll be willing to work with you. Uh, and the third question was? Um, uh, our residential foreclosures. Um, oh, residential foreclosures. Oof, this jumps uh, area uh, quite mm -hmm. dramatically here. Uh, so there's a there's a, a stay on foreclosure. So this is obviously not going to last uh, forever. Um, uh, are we going to see a lot of short sales? I, I'm I'm. Oh, I, I I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I I I don't know. I'd have to think about this. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll come back and revisit that at some other yes. point. But, but thank you all. Um, uh, th thank you, Professor Gilbert. Thank you, everybody, for, for participating. Thank you all for those of you who were able to stay on a little bit longer. Um, we will make this uh, video available to everybody. And as I mentioned earlier, next week's session will be on negotiating. So we can pick up some, uh, Professor Gilbert, where you, where you left off around how to negotiate with, um, with, with vendors, suppliers, with banks, and, and lenders, and those sorts of things. So with Very that, good. thank you all. Have a great week.